during the, during the worship, Debbie came over to me and um, actually came over and said, "Hey, can we can we have a time of, of prayer for a family that uh, that basically the, the the young man grew up with her kids? Um, uh, he's he's uh, or something of that nature. Uh, he was he was about a thirty thirty one year old young man, and last week he was in a uh, basically a logging accident." And uh, he was unstrapping the, uh, the load, and the logs rolled on him. And um, he did pass away. His name was Cody Renfro. And so if we would, just let's take a moment and pray for the Renfro family at this moment uh, with the loss of this young man. Because um, obviously it's a devastating situation, and obviously in an accident of that nature, it's, it, it compounds some of the effects. So let's just go to the Father for a moment. Lord, I, I do come to you on behalf of the Renfro family. Uh, Father, I know this is not necessarily the, I, I try to be more jovial on the start of a, of a sermon, but yet at the same time, you, you are a God who meets us at every point of our need. And right now, the Renfro family is in, in special need of your grace and your mercy and your compassion and your love as you um, minister and speak to them um, during the loss of, of Cody. Father, I, we know that accidents happen, and the reason accidents happen is because we, we live in a fallen world. This is something that when we are finally with you forevermore, we, we don't have to worry about that any longer. For there is no more death and no more pain and no more suffering and sorrow. There, there, we are glorified with you. And Father, I don't, I don't know Cody, but I pray that he had a relationship with your son Jesus. Because if he did, then the moment he passed here on this side of eternity, he was present with you. And Father, as a result, if he did indeed have a relationship with you, then we do not have to grieve as the world grieves because we have a hope and we have a future. And we have the knowledge of the reality that if we are indeed in Christ, that we will one day see you and see those loved ones that we have, have lost on this side of eternity. And so, Father, I pray for this family, and I pray for your mercy to be upon them. Father, over these next few moments, as... We open up this passage of Scripture out of Hebrews. Father, I pray that you would speak life into us, that you would increase our faith, that you would help us to be men and women of courage and vitality, that we would be heroic even in the expression of our faith, that we'd be valiant, that that people would look at us and go, They are different. They are not like everybody else. They don't face the challenges of this world the way that that I or the other people I know face it. And may, may the way that we walk in this world be so unique, so distinct, that, Father, that you would let them even come and ask us, why are you different? Father, may our lives be that kind of radical in the way we live and pursue you and display our obedience. God, I don't want to just be known as a good person. I don't want to just be known as a a nice guy or somebody that every now and then is kind of funny. I, I want to be known as one who is wholeheartedly, completely and utterly your child. And Father, I pray that for First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, I pray that we would be a, a church that is absolutely completely and utterly sold out to you and your glory. Father, minister to us now over these next few moments. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would begin turning to the book of Hebrews. Um, If you do not have a Bible, you can grab one of those Bibles in the pew back in front of you. You can turn to uh, the New Testament there to page 175. And that is where we are. Um, page 175 in the New Testament, that's, that's Hebrews chapter 11. Um, and if you do not have a Bible, we would love for you to take that home with you as a gift from us. We desire for all people to be reading the Word and spending time in the Word. Uh, 
I've titled today's message, What Do You See? What do you see? We've been in this journey since the start of January on this journey of, of what is faith and how do we live our faith out in the midst of a, of a watching world. And that is what we're going to be continuing on today as we look at just verse 7. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. So here's what we read. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. It's a small verse, but there's a lot of information there, and there's a lot of truth that we need to unpack in these few, ver- in these few, few lines of this seventh verse. So if you're taking notes in your listening guide, your very first point is probably the most important point. It's the one that I'm going to spend the most time on. But the first point that you see this morning is that faith requires action before results. Faith requires actions before results. Look again with me in the passage. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark. So you all know the story of Noah, right? You know, so it, and, and, and partly because of the fact that you all live in Hardy County. I mean, how many of you all have seen the story of Noah, <laughs> right? I mean, how many of you have participated in the story of Noah? <laughs> exactly. So when we go to the story of Noah, obviously we know that this is a story where Humanity has continued to escalate into sin. And last week, for or the last time we were together, we, we looked at, at a guy named Enoch. And Enoch had a son whose name was Methuselah. Now, one of the things I didn't get into last time with, with Enoch was how with, with Methuselah, he himself is even a blessing to Enoch. We talked about the rewards that Enoch was, was looking forward to uh, in, verse, in verse 7. Uh, excuse me, in verse 6. But, but with, with Enoch's story, the other thing that we see is he has this son, Methuselah, who is the guy that becomes the oldest man in the Bible. And it's as if God is waiting because the children of, of, of Adam and Eve, the, the descendants of Adam and Eve, have become more and more and more and more corrupt. They are a vile people. And they, they, they're, if you can think of the imagination of abomination, if you can think of wickedness, that is what these individuals were living life like. They were just reckless, okay? But yet Enoch walked with God, and he has this son, Methuselah, and it's as if God is showing great grace towards even Enoch, even after he has taken him home, because the floods for Noah's day actually come the same year that Methuselah dies. So it's as if God waits for Methuselah to die in order to honor the faithfulness of Enoch, and then the judgment falls. Okay? This is kind of your historical, your stuff. So now, when it comes to Noah, a descendant, obviously, of Methuselah and Enoch, when he finally comes to him, God comes to him and says, Noah, I'm going to destroy the world. And... Noah's like, okay. And he goes, I want you to build an ark, a big boat. And Noah's like, I, I, don't, I don't understand. There's no water around here like that. <laughs> right? And remember, up to this point, you're, you're living in a pre-flood world. This is something you have to keep in mind. You are living in a pre-flood world. The world was a different context. You're also, you're looking at a world that is closer to Adam and Eve than we are. So this goes back to the play that, that Tabitha wrote about at Christmas. You know, when one of the students questioned the professor, it says, you know, according to evolution, things get better and better. But yet, as I look at the world, it gets worse and worse. So how can it get better and better if evolution is correct when the reality is it gets worse? worse and worse. So you're looking at this, closer to Adam it is, the better off it is. 
And this is the reason why Methuselah lives 900-something years. This is the reason why they live into the hundreds of years. Is because they're living in a closer state. Sin has not tainted the world as badly. This is a progression. And at this point, it's like God looks at it and goes, man, I, I, I wish I hadn't made man in this context the way that they are. So he says, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start over, if you will, through the life of Noah. But there's been no rain at this point. It's never rained before. All the water they've had has just been from other ground. And so now God tells Noah, I'm going to send this great rain. Noah doesn't know what that means, but he says, well, I'm going to give you this instruction for this ark. And Noah says, okay. He starts building it. Now, you all remember, how long does it take Noah to build the ark? 120 years. Now, for 120 years, we know from, from 1 Peter and other locations that Noah is not just building the ark, but he's also preaching to the people. And he's telling the people, you've got to repent. You've got to repent. If you repent, God will spare you. If you repent, God won't release this judgment upon you. And what do the people do? Nothing. They absolutely ignore everything that Noah says. In fact, we can, it doesn't take much righteous imagination to sit there and go, I bet they made fun of him. I mean, think about it. You're sitting there, he's building a boat that's so big that no water that they have is going to float it. He's talking about this thing called rain that's never happened before. And they're sitting there going, <laughs> water's going to come from the sky, huh, Noah? Yeah, I believe it when pigs fly, right? This is the kind of stuff that's going on. And so for 120 years, he's building the ark with his sons. You've got to imagine some of the family conflict that took place over that 120 years. As dad says, all right, sons, let's go out and work another day. And the boy's even possibly going, are you serious? My friends were just telling me the other day how crazy you are, you know? And yet, because of their faithfulness and because they, because they did believe, they continued to come to work day in and day out and build this ark. Finally, God starts telling them, okay, now it's time to bring in all the animals. And you all know the story, you know, two by two, though there's actually a little bit more than just that with the clean animals and stuff. But and so they start to come into the ark, and they're all in there, and then the floods come, or the rains come. And you'll remember do you remember who closed the ark door? God did. God did. And it says in Jesus' day, it says that even up until the day that the door was closed, that men and women were being married and given into marriage. In other words, the people of the day, even up to the day that the door was shut, did not believe the message that Noah was telling them. And as a result, on that day, only Noah and his family are saved. Now, the point that I'm making here, though, is that faith requires action before results. And so the question you have to ask yourself is this. When God tells you this is what you're supposed to do or this is how you're supposed to, to behave in this world, this is the, the, the commission and task that I have assigned you for, how long do you work before you get tired? How long do you go until the ridicule is so intense that you say, this isn't worth it? What kind of pressure gets put upon you that you sit there and say, I've had enough. This Jesus thing, it isn't worth it. At what point do you stop expressing your faith until the reward comes. For Noah, it was 120 years. Now, remember, we've been walking through this entire journey through faith issues, and we're going to start seeing some more like with Abraham and others. But these are men who, for many of them, they never actually even got to see what the Father had promised them on, that, on this side of eternity. But yet they believed him anyway and said, I will press on. Do you have that kind of fortitude? Do you have that kind of faith? Do you have that kind of tenacity to say, Father, I believe you, even when everyone around me tells me this is an impossibility. But I know that you know, or that I know that I know that I know that you told me this is what I'm supposed to do, and so I will walk with you. If I never see the fruits of the results, if I never see the reward of the faithfulness, I believe you, period. 
Do you walk that kind of way? Do you live that kind of life? Let me, let me kind of give you some, just some, some examples even right here. You know, for a while now, we've had these truelife.org cards in the back of the church. As you walk out, they're on the, each side of the tables as you go out. We say that we believe that Jesus is for all people, right? We say, oh, everybody should come to church and worship the Lord God. And we, and we made it real simple for you. We provided even these little cards that have every single time of our church services on here. And this is, this is, like, this is like first step stuff. This is, this is real easy stuff, okay? This is, this is the kind of stuff. It's like, it's, it's like this. It's like, hey, do you have a church home? And he would say no because <laughs> it's Parker, man. Do you, do, you have a church, do you have a church home? Say no. No, sir. He said, see, he said no, sir. Good man. Don't listen to your mama. Don't listen to your mom. Don't listen to your mom. Listen to me at this point. Okay, this is my, this is my illustration with you, okay? So, do you, do you have a church home again? No. No, he said no, okay? So, hey, we would love to invite you to First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. Our service times are on this card. Hey, and if you have any questions, you can go to that website, truelife.org on there, and they've got all kinds of questions that can, that, about life that you could have answered. Did you, did you, did you see that? that? That's an introductory kind of thing. Okay, I didn't get into the gospel with them. I, now, I hope, I hope that this is the start of a conversation. I hope that this, this grows into the place where eventually I do have the opportunity. I, I hope that something happens in his life. You can hold on to that. You can pass it to one of your friends at school. Uh, I, I hope something happens at, in his life that, that where he goes, you know what? I do have some questions right now. And I remember, I remember that guy gave me that card at the, at the gas station. That guy gave me the card at the, at the Walmart. That guy gave me that card at work or that guy gave me the card wherever. Uh, and, and you know what? He said that there were answers on that website. Where's, where's that card? Where's that card at? Grab the card, look at it. Oh, here it is. And then starting asking those questions, going to the website. And then hopefully, so they're going, you know what? He also talked about church. Maybe I need to go visit that church. Now we say we believe people need to come to church. Take the card out of it for a moment. When was the last time you invited somebody to church? When was the last time? Now let's, now let's even take it further because that's just the invitation part. That's just this church thing. But what is it that we have all been called to? We've all been called to become ministers of the gospel of reconciliation. So what does that mean? If we are all called to be the gospels of the ministers of reconciliation, what does that mean that every single one who is born again is called to do? Share the gospel. We are all called and commissioned to share the gospel. So now I'm, let's, take, let's take it a little deeper. I just now asked, when was the last time you invited somebody to church? Now let's get a little uglier. When was the last time you actually shared your faith with another individual and you told them this is the way how you can come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you understand? Beloved, we are supposed, now here, we're talking about faith. We're talking about faith. You tell me, oh, I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him. I believe that. But I'm certainly not telling anybody about it. Where is your faith? But I'm, but I'm afraid of what they might say. I'm afraid they might reject me. I'm, I'm afraid that, that uh, well, you can just name any kind of fear. They're all irrational and they're all lies of the adversary. They're lies. And so you have to sit there and say, by faith, I claim that I am a child of the king. By faith, I recognize who I am as co-heir with Christ. By faith, I know the Holy Spirit is the one that indwells me. By faith, it is actually the Holy Spirit who gives me the words to speak in moments that I don't know what to say. By faith, I trust him. And so therefore, I step out, and I actually engage in the conversation with individuals. Now again, you know, Justin and I, we, we have a time of testimony tonight, as well as some others. I, I think Carson's going to be sharing tonight. I think Paul's sharing tonight. I think Emma might be sharing tonight. We're going to be just sharing about just what God's been doing in some of all of our lives. But Justin and I are going to be sharing about our missions trip. And obviously, on a missions trip, it's real easy to share the gospel. You know Why? 
You know why it's easy to share the gospel on a mission trip? Because you all are expecting us to give a testimony. So you want to know the best way to tell to share, share the gospel with somebody? Get an accountability partner. Have somebody that will ask you, did you share the gospel this week? Because when you got to hold when somebody's holding you accountable to something, you have a more of a sense of I better do this. We, we had a conversation while we were even down there and we were talking about why do Jehovah's Witnesses and why do Mormons send everybody out two by twos? Why did Jesus send the disciples out two by two? Because when I'm down there with somebody else and they're standing there and I know that I'm, know that I'm supposed to share the gospel, if there's somebody there, I go, I better not mess this up. I better share the gospel. But if they're not there, guess what we do? We start to have little conversations in our head. And we start to justify. And we start to rationalize. And we start to talk ourselves out of the very thing that the Holy Spirit has just told us to do. So you really want to know the truth is not only get an accountability partner, but take the accountability partner with you. And then share the gospel. Beloved, this is the reason why we share our faith. Do we really believe the things that we say that we believe? You know, I, I, I've, I've talked about this even the last several weeks as well. We, we, say that we, we say we love young people. We say these kind of things. We say that we want young people to be a part of our, our church. And yet you all know what kind of conditions our children's department is in. You know how bad our check-in system is over here. Now, you can, we can bemoan and we can say, oh, well, it's, you know, the, wor the world just needs to, the world needs to change and to quit being so, you know, uh, sensitive. Well, guess what? The world's sensitive. And you ain't going to change that. All right? And so when a, when a mom brings in their kid and they come over there and they're like, this is your check-in system for my kid? They're kind of like, well, I'm not coming back here. And we can bemoan and we can, we can argue and say, oh, no, that's not really the issue. Yeah, it is part of the issue. It is part of the issue. And, and we say things like, well, why do I always have to be the one to change? Well, you know why you have to be the one to change? It's because G Paul says, I have become all things to all people that I might win some for the Christ. To the Roman, I became a Roman. To the Jew, I became a Jew. To the Greek, I became a Greek. I became all things to all people that I might win some to Jesus Christ. So the ones that need to change are the ones that actually have a relationship with him so that we might engage those who do not have a relationship with him and earn the right to tell them about Jesus. That's the reason why we need to change things. And so we've, you, you all tasked us saying, look, we've got problems with our restroom facilities. We've got problems with our children's department. We've got problems with, with future expansion and growth. We've got these kind of issues. And some of you are sitting there going, yeah, but we've been in a 3% decline for the last 12 years. Actually, it's been 15 now. Well, you're right. We have been in a 3% decline for the last 15 years that we know of. Because that's the last, that when we did the strategic planning committee, that's where we stopped. We, we didn't go back beyond the computer records. So we know we've been in a 3% decline. And so some of you are sitting there going, well, I don't think, I don't think it's wise stewardship to to enter into a building campaign of some sorts, to meet the, meet the task and the, and the objectives that, that you all assigned to the Long Range Capital Improvement Committee. Well, we're right still back to what is faith. We're right back to what is faith. What is faith? Do we trust the Father or do we trust our checkbook? Do we trust what the Father is commissioning us to do? And if his, is he telling us, reach the community around us? Because if he's telling us to reach the community around us, what is going to be required of us? Action, change, steps of faith. If we do not step out on faith, if we do not walk by faith, if we don't live by faith, we are not proving that we are people of faith. And yet this is what we've all been called to be. This is the reason the 11th chapter of Hebrews is written. It is to give us an example. Remember how it even started out in verse 2? It said, for by it the men of old gained approval because they lived 
by faith. It was an expression. Every one of these examples that we're looking at was one who took action before there was results. And by the way, as we get to it, some of them took action and they lost their lives. Some of them took action, and I've already alluded to this, and didn't see the results in their lifetime, though the results eventually came. What if we take action and we're the ones who die before we see the end result and see what God actually had us to accomplish? Would it be a failure just because we died? No. These men and these women were commended for their faith. What do we see? That's the question. What do you see? What percentage? What direction? Where is the Father moving? There, there are several other things that we, we could look through here. There's only one more that I even kind of want to mention. is, is last year, in the, in, starting in September, I, I preached that sermon series on, on the road to recovery. And I preached that sermon series because of the fact that every one of us, If we're going to grow in intimacy with the Father, we have to deal with the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups, the sins in our life. We have to deal with them. It's a requirement. And it's the reason why we offer a course like Deeper Change. And the sign-up sheet's in the back. And I know those classes are going to be starting right now this month. So this is like your last Sunday where you could potentially sign up for those classes. But this is a chance for you to sit there and say, Father, I'm, I'm opening myself up and I'm saying, expose to me the truth of who's with inside of me or what's inside of me. Reveal to me any unknown sin that's there because, I, because I'm a wicked person and I walk in the way of wickedness. But yet I don't want to live that way. I want to live with intimacy with you. I want to, I want to know you. I want to know the fullness of your, of your grace. And so, so I'm coming to you and saying, God, I'm, I'm being transparent. Speak to my heart. That's what this class is all about. Well, you can sign up, and then the teachers and stuff will be contacting you probably even this week, set, trying to schedule a time where everybody can meet. We go through these kinds of things, and here's what the issue is. And I, I'm, really, I'm going somewhere with this. Most of us, we don't want to deal with the problems in our own lives. We, we want to deal with the problems in Steve's lives. We want to deal with the problems in Nick's life. We want to deal with the problems in Lacey's life. But we don't want to deal with the problems in Scott's life. We like to point all of our little fingers. And what is that old saying? When I point one at you, three are back at me, (laughs) right? Or four, depending on how I hold my thumb. (laughs) We like to say this message, for example, some of you are sitting there going, this message, is it for me? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. This message is for you. This is the reason why you are here today is because this is a message for you. No, no, no matter what expression is on your face, this message is for you today, okay? Now, so you're sitting there, and, and so some of us, what happens is, is a lot of us battle these, these, these hurts, these habits, these hangups, and they actually start to affect our brain and the way that we think. And so then all of a sudden there's this stigma. Well, if I, if I deal with it, if I recognize this and I start to deal with it, people will start to make fun of me. People will start to look down upon me. It's for this reason that next Sunday night we're offering the movie Resilience. Resilience is a movie that actually deals with mental health. And the reason why we're offering that is because with the Hardy, health, uh, Hardy County Ministerial Association, Micah Henderson came to us and shared with us about this movie. And the reason why it's starting at 530 is because there's going to be a bunch of mental health professionals that are here to help us understand that mental health issues really are not these, these taboo kind of things of, oh my goodness, they've got mental health issues, let's keep them away. Because who did Jesus come to die for? All of us. He came to die for us all. And so we're going to offer this next week. At 5.30, he's, the, the professional's going to be here with their booze just for you to get information. The movie itself actually starts at 6 p.m., it will go to 7. We've said it's going to go till 7.30 only because of the fact that there's any conversations that you all have after the movie with anybody. But the movie is actually from 6 to 7 next week. And so it's going to be opened up from 5.30 to 7.30. But that is what this resilience is about. It's basically for us sitting here saying, you know what? By faith, I'm going to be open to a conversation 
about something that might make me feel uncomfortable. By the way, every time that we're stepping out on faith, it always makes us feel uncomfortable. But that's what it's about. All right, I said I was going to spend the majority of the time on, on this first point, and I have. So now let's hit the last two rather quickly. Second point is this. Faith results in salvation for some. Faith results in salvation for some. Let's go back to the text again. For faith, excuse me, by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. And I've already, we already did this when we talked about the story. But how many got saved? Noah and his, his family, his household. That's it. Eight people got saved. That's all. And the animals. Eight people and some animals got saved. That's it. Everybody else died. Now, now Jesus says something very similar, does he not, about salvation? Jesus says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there are that go that way. And narrow is the road that leads to life, and few there are that find it. But now you're back to the story of the sower and the seed. Is it your job to save people? No. It is your job to be obedient to the Father and sow the seed. It is his responsibility to do the supernatural growth. It is his responsibility to birth faith into those who will receive salvation. That is God's job. All of salvation is based upon him and him alone. Our job as his children is nothing more than obedience. Noah in obedience built the ark. Noah in obedience preached to those who were there. And at the end of the day, the only ones that got saved were his family. Does that mean that Noah was a failure? No. Noah's obedience, oh, Noah's success is not based upon the results of earthly eyes. The results are based upon the Father's. He is the one who determines what is a success and what is not a success. He's the only one that matters at the end of the day. And so Noah goes out, he sows the seed, and only eight saved. And so what do we see from this? What do you see? One, faith requires action before results, and faith results in salvation for some. Every time that we walk in faith, it is always with the express intent to bring glory to the Father. And if we're bringing glory to the Father then a watching world is going to take notice of that, and there will be some in that who will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Our job is not the result. Our job is the obedience. And then this leads into the final one. So faith requires action before results, and faith results in salvation for some. The last point this morning is this, is that faith rewards the saved with righteousness. Faith rewards the saved with righteousness. Look at the last part here. So by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Remember back in verse 6, we were already told and we've already referenced it. It says that without faith it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he uh, is and, what he, and, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Part of what our responsibility is to actually believe that God is a rewarder of our lives. And when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, again, it is not our righteousness. It is not something that I manufacture. I am righteous because of the one who lives in me. Christ Jesus in me, the hope of my glory. Jesus in me is my righteousness. Jesus in me is my purity. Jesus in me is my holiness. Because of the one who lives in me, now my life is different. And so when we walk by faith, we are walking in a manner that is, is showing the evidence of our life change in Christ Jesus. James says it this way. He says, you tell me you have faith? Well, show me your works. Because faith without works is dead. Now, is he telling us that we have salvation because of our works? No, because we already know that from, from, from Paul. 
in Ephesians chapter 2. For it is not by, by works you are saved, but by faith. For it's, the, it's this free gift of God so that no one could boast. We know this reality. So, so what, is, what, is the, what is this work? It is the evidence of our faith. And our faith then is not something that produces the righteousness. It is the gift, the reward that God gives us because of Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we step out on faith. We believe him. We receive Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Our lives are changed. We are now righteous. And we pursue him by displaying faith. And then one day, one day when we are no longer on this side of eternity and we're standing before him, he then examines our works and he says, oh, that was, that's gold and that's silver and that's precious stone. That's gonna survive because that's work of faith. Oh, but, but that, that's wood and that's hay and that's stubble. And it's going to burn up. And you're going to suffer loss. Beloved, I don't want to suffer loss. And I certainly don't want First Baptist Church of Bowling Green to be a church where the lampstand is snuffed out because we didn't walk by faith. You get to the book of Revelation, you see these seven churches, and it talks about how, you know, this is what I know about you. This is what I commend you for. But this is what I have against you. And if you don't repent... I will remove your lampstand. In other words, I will snuff out that church. What is the testimony? What is the legacy that First Baptist Church of Bowling Green is going to have? What is going to be the faith journey that we leave behind to the generations that come after us? What will the generations behind us, if Jesus tarries, if Jesus tarries just even two generations, if he tarries that long, what will those generations say about First Baptist Church of Bowling Green? that we were self-absorbed and we wanted it our way and not his way, that we didn't care about the lost people of the community, and so therefore God had to come in and take the lampstand away from us? Oh, God, never that be. Do not let that be, Lord Jesus. Let us be a church that is faithful to you. Let us be a church that is obedient to you. Let us be a church that learns what faith means. Let us be a church that exalts you and glorifies you and lifts you up and says, I want all of my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength to be all devoted to you, Lord God. That we want to have families who put you first. That we want to have ministries that say it is all about the proclamation of the gospel. We want to have ministries that, that are not just for here in Bowling Green, but for around the world. That we want to see people everywhere of every tribe, tongue, and nation to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord God, may that be the testimony of First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. Oh, Father, move in this place and move among your people. And let us be obedient to you in every aspect of who we are. You are good. You are glorious. You are God. Let us walk by faith. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.